Good evening. I hope you've had a great day today. Welcome to BBJ's Bedtime Stories. My name is Big Voice J. This is a show where we get you ready for a good night's sleep with public domain short stories for kids and adults. Links to tonight's stories, links to tonight's stories are found at the show notes at bedtimewithbvj.com. Tonight's story The Tale of Mr. Jeremy Fisher by Beatrix Potter Once upon a time there was a frog called Mr. Jeremy Fisher. He lived in a little damp house among the buttercups at the edge of a pond. The water was all slippy sloppy in the larder and in the back passage. But Mr. Jeremy liked getting his feet wet. Nobody ever scolded him, and he never caught a cold. He was quite pleased when he looked out and saw large drops of rain splashing in the pond. I will get some worms and go fishing and catch a dish of minnows for my dinner, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. If I catch more than five fish, I will invite my friends Mr. Alderman Ptolemy Torres and Sir Isaac Newton. The alderman, however, eats salad. Mr. Jeremy put on a Macintosh and a pair of shiny galoshes, took his rod and basket, and set off with enormous hops to the place where he kept his boat. The boat was round and green, and very like other. The boat was round and green, and very like the other lily leaves, it was tied to a water plant in the middle of the pond. Mr. Jeremy took a reed pole and pushed the boat out into open water. A good place for minnows, Mr. Jeremy Fisher. Mr. Jeremy stuck his pole into the mud and fastened his boat to it. Then he settled himself cross-legged and arranged his fishing tackle. He had the dearest little red float. His rod was a tough stalk of grass, his line was a fine long white horse hair, and he tied a little wriggling worm at the end. The rain trickled down his back, and for nearly an hour he stared at the float. This is getting tiresome. I think I should like some lunch, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. He pushed back again amongst the water plants and took some lunch out of his basket. I will eat a butterfly sandwich and wait till the shower is over, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. A great big water beetle came up underneath the lily leaf and tweaked the toe of one of his galoshes. Mr. Jeremy crossed his legs up shorter, out of reach, and went on eating his sandwich. Once or twice something moved about with a rustle and a splash amongst the rushes at the side of the pond. I trust that is not a rat, said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. I think I had better get away from here. Mr. Jeremy shoved the boat out again a little way and dropped in the bait. There was a bite almost directly. The float became... The float gave a tremendous bobbit. A minnow! A minnow! I have him by the nose! cried Jeremy Fisher, jerking up his rod. But what a horrible surprise! Instead of a smooth, fat minnow, Mr. Jeremy landed little Jack Sharp, the stickleback, covered with spines. The stickleback floundered about the boat, pricking and snapping until he was quite out of breath. Then he jumped back into the water, and a shoal of other little fishes put their heads out and laughed at Mr. Jeremy Fisher. And while Mr. Jeremy sat disconsolately on the edge of his boat, sucking his sore fingers and peering down into the water, a much worse thing happened. A really frightful thing it would have been if Mr. Jeremy had not been wearing a Macintosh. A great big enormous trout came up, kerplop, with a splash and it seized Mr. Jeremy with a snap. Ow, ow, ow! Then it turned and dived down to the bottom of the pond. But the trout was so displeased with the taste of the Macintosh that in less than half a minute it spat him out again, and the only thing it swallowed were Mr. Jeremy's galoshes. Mr. Jeremy bounced up to the surface of the water like a cork and the bubbles out of a soda water bottle, and he swam with all his might to the edge of the pond. He scrambled out on the first bank he came to, and he hopped home across the meadow 
of his Macintosh all in tatters. "'What a mercy that was not a pike,' said Mr. Jeremy Fisher. "'I have lost my rod and basket, "'but it does not much matter, for I am sure "'I should never have dared to go fishing again.' "'He put some sticking plaster on his fingers, "'and his friends both came to dinner. "'He could not offer them fish, "'but he had something else in his larder. "'Sir Isaac Newton wore his black and gold waistcoat, "'and Mr. Alderman Ptolemy Tortoise "'brought a salad with him in a string bag. "'And instead of a rice, "'and instead of a nice dish of minnows, "'they had a roasted grasshopper with lady bird sauce, "'which frogs consider a beautiful treat. "'But I think it must have been nasty. "'The End "'You know, if you're going out to have your friends over for dinner, "'you probably should do the sensible thing "'and let someone else do it. You've got uh, other things to do. You've got planning. You've got all kinds of things that are taking up your time. Take one of those things off of your plate, so to speak. Go to HelloFresh.com. And it code BVJ in the promo code. And it will do absolutely nothing because this is not a sponsored read. I would like to tell you that if you have any comments or questions, you please email me, BigVoiceJ at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Our next story. The Tale of the Pie and the Patty Pan by Beatrix Potter. Once upon a time, there was a pussycat called Ribby, who invited a little dog called Duchess to tea. Come in good time, my dear Duchess, said Ribby's letter, and we will have something so very nice. I'm making it in a pie dish. A pie dish with a pink rim. You never tasted anything so good. And you shall eat it all. I will eat muffins, my dear Duchess, wrote Ribby. I will come very punctually, my dear Ribby, wrote Duchess. And then at the end she added, I hope it isn't mouse. And then she thought that did not look quite polite, so she scratched out isn't mouse and changed it to I hope it will be fine, and she gave her letter to the postman. But she thought a great deal about Ribby's pie, and she read Ribby's letter over and over again. I am dreadfully afraid it will be mouse, said Duchess to herself. I really couldn't, couldn't eat mouse pie, and I shall have to eat it because it is a party, and my pie was going to be veal and ham. A pink and white pie dish? And so is mine. Just like Ribby's dishes, they were both bought at Tabitha Twitchett's. Duchess went into her larder and took the pie off the shelf and looked at it. Oh, what a good idea! Why shouldn't I rush along and put my pie into Ribby's oven when Ribby isn't there? Ribby, in the meantime, had received Duchess's answer. And as soon as she was sure that the little dog would come, she popped her pie into the oven. There were two ovens, one above the other. Some other knobs and handles were only ornamental and not intended to open. Ribby put the pie into the lower oven. The door was very stiff. The top oven bakes too quickly, said Ribby to herself. Ribby put on some coal and swept up the hearth. Then she went out with a can to the well for water to fill up the kettle. Then she began to set the room in order, for it was the sitting room as well as the kitchen. When Ribby had laid the table, she went out down the field to the farm to fetch milk and butter. When she came back, she peeped into the bottom oven. The pie looked very comfortable. Ribby put on her shawl and bonnet and went out again with a basket to the village shop to buy a packet of tea a pound of lump sugar, and a pot of marmalade. And just at the same time, Duchess came out of her house at the other end of the village. Ribby met Duchess halfway down the street, also carrying a basket covered with a cloth. They only bowed to one another, they did not speak, because they were going to have a party. As soon as Duchess had got round the corner out of sight, she simply ran straight away to Ribby's house. Ribby went into the shop and bought what she required and came out, after her pleasant gossip with Cousin Tabitha Twitchett. Ribby went on to Timothy Baker's and bought the muffins, 
Then she went home. There seemed to be a sort of scuffling noise in the back passage as she was coming in at the front door, but there was nobody there. Duchess, in the meantime, had slipped out at the back door. It is a very odd thing that Ribby's pie was not in the oven when I put mine in, and I can't find it anywhere. I've looked all over the house. I put my pie into a nice hot oven at the top. I could not turn any of the other handles. I think they're all shams, said Duchess. But I wish I could have removed the pie made of mouse. I cannot think what she's done with it. I heard Ribby coming and I had to run out by the back door. Duchess went home and brushed her beautiful black coat and then she picked a bunch of flowers in her garden as a present for Ribby and passed the time until the clock struck four. Ribby, having assured herself by careful search that there was really no one hiding in the cupboard or in the larder, went upstairs to change her dress. She came downstairs again and made the tea and put the teapot on the hob. She peeped again into the bottom oven. The pie had become a lovely brown and it was steaming hot. She sat down before the fire to wait for the little dog. I am glad I used the bottom oven, said Ribby. The top one would certainly have been very much too hot. Very punctually at four o'clock, Duchess started to go to the party. At a quarter past four to the minute, there came a most genteel little tap tappity. Is Mrs. Ribston at home, inquired Duchess in the porch. Come in! "'And how do you do, my dear Duchess?' cried Ribby. "'I hope I see you well.' "'Quite well, I thank you. "'And how do you do, my dear Ribby?' said Duchess. "'I've brought you some flowers. "'What a delicious smell of pie! "'Oh, what lovely flowers! "'Yes, it is mouse and bacon.' "'I think it wants another five minutes,' said Ribby. "'Just a shade longer. "'I will pour out the tea while we wait.' Do you take sugar, my dear Duchess? Oh, yes, please, my dear Ribby, and may I have a lump upon my nose? With pleasure, my dear Duchess. Duchess sat up with the sugar on her nose and sniffed. How good that pie smells! I do love veal and ham. I mean to say mouse and bacon. She dropped the... She dropped the sugar in confusion and had to go hunting near the tea table. She dropped the sugar in confusion and had to go hunting under the tea table, so she did not see which oven Ribby opened in order to get out the pie. Ribby set the pie upon the table and there was a very savory smell. Duchess came out from under the tablecloth munching sugar and sat up on a chair. I will first cut the pie for you. I'm going to have muffin and marmalade, said Ribby. I think, thought Duchess to herself, I think it would be wiser if I helped myself to buy, though Ribby did not seem to notice anything when she was cutting it. What very small, fine pieces it is cooked into. I did not remember that I had minced it up so fine. I suppose this is a quicker oven than my own. The pie dish was emptying rapidly. Duchess had had four helps already and was fumbling with the spoon. A little more bacon, my dear Duchess, said Ribby. Thank you, my dear Ribby. I was only feeling for the patty pan. The patty pan, my dear Duchess? The patty pan that held up the pie crust, said Duchess, blushing under her black coat. Oh, I didn't put one in, my dear Duchess, said Ribby. I don't think that it is necessary in pies made of mouse. Duchess fumbled with the spoon. I find it, said anxiously. "'There isn't a patty pan,' said Ribby, looking perplexed. "'Yes, indeed, my dear Ribby. Where can it have gone to?' said Duchess. Duchess looked very much alarmed and continued to scoop the inside of the pie dish. "'I have only four patty pans, and they are all in the cupboard.' Duchess set up a howl. "'I shall die!' I shall die. I have swallowed a patty pan. Oh, my dear Ribby, I do feel so ill. It is impossible, my dear Duchess. There was not a patty pan. Yes, there was, my dear Ribby. I am sure I have swallowed it. Let me prop you up with a pillow, my dear Duchess, 
Where do you think you feel it? Oh, I do feel it so all over me, my dear Ribby. Shall I run for the doctor? Oh, yes, yes. Fetch Dr. Maggotty, my dear Ribby. He is a pie himself. He will certainly understand. Ribby settled Duchess in an armchair before the fire and set out and hurried to the village to look for the doctor. She found him at the smithy. Ribby explained that her guest had swallowed a penny pan. Dr. Maggotty hopped so fast that Ribby had to run. It was most conspicuous. All the village could see that Ribby was fetching the doctor. But while Ribby had been hunting for the doctor, a curious thing had happened to Duchess, who had been left by herself sitting before the fire, sighing and groaning and feeling very unhappy. How could I have swallowed it? Such a large thing as a patty pan. She sat down again and stared mournfully at the grate. The fire crackled and danced and something sizzled. Duchess started. She opened the door of the top oven. Out came a rich, steamy flavor of veal and ham. And there stood a fine brown pie. And through a hole in the top of the pie crust, there was a glimpse of a little tin patty pan. Duchess drew a long breath. Then I must have been eating mouth. No wonder I feel ill. But perhaps I should feel worse if I had really swallowed a patty pan, Duchess reflected. What a very awkward thing to have to explain to Ribby. I think I will put my pie in the backyard and say nothing about it. When I go home, I will run round and take it away. She put it outside the back door and sat down again by the fire and shut her eyes. When Ribby arrived with the doctor, she seemed fast asleep. I am feeling very much better, said Duchess, waking up with a jump. I am truly glad to hear it. He has brought you a pill, my dear Duchess. I think I should feel quite well if he only felt my pulse, said Duchess, backing away from the magpie who sidled up with something in his beak. It is only a bread pill. You had better take it. Drink a little milk, my dear Duchess. I am feeling very much better, my dear Ribby, said Duchess. Do you not think that I had better go home before it gets dark? Perhaps it might be wise, my dear Duchess. Ribby and Duchess said goodbye affectionately, and Duchess started home. Halfway up the lane... She stopped and looked back. Ribby had gone in and shut her door. Duchess slipped through the fence and ran round to the back of Ribby's house and peeped through the yard. Under the roof of the pigsty, under the upon the roof of the pigsty sat Dr. Maggotty and three jackdaws. The jackdaws were eating pie crust. The jackdaws were eating pie crust, and the magpie was drinking gravy out of a patty pan. Duchess ran home feeling uncommonly silly. When Ribby came out for a pail full of water to wash up the tea things, she found a pink and white pie dish lying smashed in the middle of the yard. Ribby stared with amazement. Did you ever see the like? Oh, there really was a patty pan. But my patty pans are all in the kitchen cupboard. Well, I never did. Next time I want to give a party... I will invite Cousin Tabitha Twitchit. So when you end up trying to uh, do a end round around something you don't want to do, sometimes you end up looking ridiculous. How about Duchess? Getting in there and making her own pie. She's not even... She's not even on a special diet, but she just didn't like mouse. And she was so sure that she was going to have it. And she ended up eating it. She ate all of it. I think she might like it more than she's letting on. And one thing that I like more than I'm letting on, well, I guess I'll let on right now, is the fact that you can subscribe to this podcast on all the platforms. And if you are subscribed, which if you're listening to this, you most certainly are, spread the word. Let everybody know about how we get you to sleep every single night. New episodes release Monday to Friday, 
9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern. At bedtime with bvj.com. Our next story is The Great Feast by Laura E. Richards. Once the play angel came into a nursery where four little children sat on the floor with sad and troubled faces. What is the matter, dears? asked the play angel. We wanted to have a grand feast, said the child whose nursery it was. Yes, that would be delightful, said the play angel. But there is only one cookie, said the child whose nursery it was. And it is a very small cookie, said the child who was a cousin, and therefore felt a right to speak. Not big enough for myself, said the child whose nursery it was. The other two children said nothing because they were not relations, but they looked at the cookie with large eyes and their mouths went up to the middle and down at the sides. Well, said the play angel, suppose we have the feast just the same. I think we can manage it. She broke the cookie into four pieces and gave one piece to the littlest child. See, she said, this is a roast chicken, a brown bantam. It is just as brown and crispy as it can be, and there is cranberry sauce on one side and on the other a little mountain of mashed potato. It must be a volcano, it smokes so. Do you see? Yes, said the littlest one, and his mouth went down in the middle and up at the corners. The play angel gave a piece to the next child. Here, she said, is a little pie. Outside, as you see, it is brown and crusty, with a wreath of pastry leaves around the edge and for you in the middle. But inside it is all chicken and ham and jelly and hard-boiled eggs. Did you ever see such a pie? Never I did, said the child. Now here, said the angel to the third child, is a round cake. Look at it. The frosting is half an inch thick with candied rose leaves and angelica laid on and true lover's knots, and inside there are chopped up almonds and raisins and great slices of citron. It is the prettiest cake I ever saw, and the best. So it is I did, said the third child. Then the angel gave the last piece to the child, whose nursery it was. My dear, she said, just look. Here is an ice cream rabbit. He's snow white outside with eyes of red barley sugar. See his ears and his little snubby tail. But inside, I think you will find him pink. Now when I clap my hands and count one, two, three, you must eat the feast all up. One, two, three. So the children ate the feast all up. There, said the angel, did you ever see such a grand feast? No, never we did, said all the four children together. And there are some crumbs left over, said the angel. Come, and we will give them to the brother birds. But you don't have any, said the child whose nursery it was. Oh, yes, said the angel, I had it all. Every household needs a play angel, don't you think? Nowadays, our angels come in the form of tiny cylinders or spheres, and we ask it things, and we tell them our deepest, darkest secrets. You probably shouldn't do that. But you should let me know if you'd have a story for me to read. We're always looking for some great, great short stories to share with everybody so that we can all get to sleep. And if you have any questions or comments, please email me, bigvoicej, at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. Good night. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs)